I'm Helen Chersky and this is Zero Gravity. Welcome to the Cosmic Shambles Network. Welcome to Bordeaux in France. We're here for the European Space Agency's 72nd parabolic flight campaign. I'm Dr. Helen Chersky. And I'm Ginny Smith. We're going to be looking at some of the scientific experiments going on in this plane here, which is going to be taking off and ending up in micro G. Now, I'm going to stay as part of the ground crew, which I'm quite happy about, but Helen, you're actually going to be going up there and experiencing zero G. I am, yes, and it's a really exciting thing to do. It's the first time I've ever done it. But before we get to the actual flight itself, let's talk a little bit about what parabolic flight is all about. The basic idea of parabolic flight is beautifully simple, even though it's quite complicated to execute. And they've got a lovely diagram on the wall here, so I don't have to draw it. And the idea is that if you are falling freely, so imagine you were in a lift, for example, the top of a very tall building and the lift broke and it fell freely and you were falling inside the lift. You're moving downwards, you're accelerating because of gravity. But because the lift and you are moving at the same rate, gravity is kind of taken care of. The acceleration due to gravity is, you're, you don't see it inside the lift. There's no contact forces if you push on the lift. You can't stand on the floor. And so it feels as though you're weightless. And that's what's going on here. So the plane, and it is a plane flying here at about 6,000 meters, will fly flat for a while. And then it will turn upwards and it will accelerate up here. And this is, imagine if you're about to throw a ball and you take your arm back and you start moving your arm forward. That's what this is. The plane accelerates up at a really steep angle, 47 degrees, and at this point, the engines stop doing anything. But the plane is still going up because it's got forward momentum, but it's also now going to start falling down. So it's got speed, there's no engines, but it just goes up and up, it slows down over the top, and then it starts to fall down the other side. Now, you don't want it to fall too far, because that would cause other problems. So when you get back to about the same point on the other side, the pilot switches the engine back on, pulls it out, um, and then you're back on the level. And that the game here is that there's a huge amount of acceleration while you're doing that, so you actually, actually feel extra gravity, effective extra gravity. But then while you and the plane are just falling, so you are falling inside the plane, you can't tell. Gravity is accelerating you out, you know, the plane is moving, you are moving, you can't tell. So inside the plane, you are effectively weightless. And because you're, uh, you know, things fall quite quickly on Earth, you don't get very long in that section. However, you get enough to do science, and that's what these flights are all about. The vehicle that is going to take us on this trip is right behind me. It's an Airbus. 310 zero g apparently that bit's very important and here to talk to me about it is neil melville who knows who is the in charge of what goes on on board it seems yeah awesome? i'm the i'm the parabolic flight coordinator for the european space agency so we'll put that down in the list of cool job descriptions that we very rarely <laughs> <laughs> so um tell me a little bit about the inside like from the outside this just looks like a normal plane is it mostly a normal plane what, it is mostly a normal plane they haven't modified too much of course we need some space to float around in and to attach the experiments so they've taken out about two-thirds of the seats and padded the floors walls and ceiling to <laughs> keep us like all good idea. safe yeah that's yeah. a very good idea and um the the experiments are attached to the to the seat tracks on the on the floor um and the only other modifications really uh, in the cockpit um, they have a couple of, of accelerometers, of G-meters, so the pilots have something to follow. <laughs> and a, a couple of minor alterations to the, to the control gear. So I've been a zero-G pilot since 1997 in a multi-pilot aircraft. Uh, the, the, the pilots are sharing the three, uh, four main activities. Mm -hmm. One is flying the aircraft, second is navigating, yeah. uh, third one is system monitoring. And the fourth one is speaking with the air traffic control. Yeah. But always, at any time, only one pilot is flying, I mean acting on the controls. Yeah. For this aircraft to be as accurate as possible, yeah. we share the flying activity in three, yeah. in three axes. Mm -hmm. So one pilot is in charge of the vertical axis. Yeah. It is the, the, the guy who is pitching up and down, yeah. doing the zero G. Yeah. The other guy is maintaining the wings level, assuring that the GY will stay yeah, also at this zero. Plane doing this. Yes, yeah. wings level and yeah. no lateral acceleration. Yeah. 
uh, you cannot uh, stay as we are as we, when we are on uh, on in a car mm -hmm. when you are turning so yes. you are on the seat so yes. there is no problem but if you are uh, flying in the yeah. aircraft so as soon as there is a little acceleration yeah. uh, after after um, uh, forward mm -hmm. everybody will fly in the cockpit yes. or will fly the, Right. In, in, in the toilets that we really don't want that. Right. <laughs> so we also have to work on the longitudinal axis and the third guy is acting on the power lever mm -hmm. in order to keep a zero G also on the longitudinal axis. Direction. So there is a work for three pilots. Yeah. So we could do that for, with one pilot with, but uh, with less, uh, yeah. less accuracy. So we share the flying activity in three uh, three parts. This this will fly out over over the sea somewhere. Do you normally do um, it? Normally, if the weather's good enough, then we do it just off the coast in the Atlantic, uh, up and down, north to south. Um, if the weather's not very good, as it wasn't today, as not this week, um, then we also have a space allocated to us over the Mediterranean. Um, we're a little bit lower than the ordinary flight level to keep us away from other planes. It might be quite alarming, as you can imagine, if they see us fly past. <laughs> so we've got the big picture of what the whole plane is doing. From the, what's it like on the inside? Describe to me what happens on the inside and, and what your job is. What, what are you keeping an eye on as all of this happens? Well, what happens on the inside is once we get up to our, our cruising altitude, um, we have 20 minutes, half an hour or so to prepare the experiments before the parabolas start. We get a nice little countdown to each parabola. <laughs> Um, and then we do them every three minutes for the next couple of hours. And during that time inside, um, you, don't, you don't notice these, these crazy angles in the sky because <laughs> right. they blocked out the windows for us. Which I was, I cannot tell you how pleased I was <laughs> when I saw that. I, that that's a good idea mm. in my book. Well, yeah. it would be very, very distracting to yeah. see the horizon doing these crazy yeah. things outside yeah. and to have light streaming through perhaps on your experiment. So right. by blocking out the windows, it isolates us from all of that nonsense. Yeah. And you only really feel- As the feel, outside world is known. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares yeah. about the outside world? Are you looking out the window? Do you look out of the window or no, you just never. look at the instruments? No, never. no, no. no. <laughs> you, you see that, uh, you know, when flying an aircraft in a um, well, specific environment and changing the, the pitch and attitude, mm -hmm. maybe you have the, the sun shade mm -hmm. uh, moving and it makes uh, some vertigo. Uh -huh. So we have to avoid that. Right. There are also some reflection on the screens that we want to avoid. Right. So we put curtains in the cockpit oh. so that we uh, avoid the, the So I can't see where we were going and you couldn't see where we no, were going. No, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but the instruments no. know where yes, we're going. Yes, yeah, exactly. We, we just have the, the windshield. Uh, it keeps clear so that right. in case of emergency, we can recover the, the aircraft right. visually. But even for that, we put uh, a cap on oh, the yeah, end really? because w when you rise when you pitch up uh, up to 50 degrees yeah. sometimes you are facing the sun and right. you are completely blind right. so that we put uh, a cap yeah. and we lower the head so that the cap is just at the top of the instrument panel right and we cannot see anything outside just the, uh, the just instrument. The numbers. Yes, just the numbers. exactly. Yeah. Um, so you're only really aware of the, what the local gravity feels like, right. which is always straight down. Yeah. You don't have any sense of this back and forward and tilting. Yeah. Um, so it's always either one, yeah. which we're quite used to, or two almost, or zero. So you, this, and you've modified, this is the third or fourth version of this plane for this company? Uh, this is the third plane that Nova Space have used. Right. Um, they had a, a small Caravelle uh, way, way back when. Right. And then for many years, I think from 98 into 2014, they had an A300. Yeah. Okay. And uh, that, was, that was serial number three. So it was really right. quite an old plane. Right. Um, <laughs> it, it did a, a very large number of parabolas. It served them very well. It's a nice workhorse. Well, it's probably time to get and see what's inside the plane here. So, okay. so we can go that way and have Let's a look. Go. Yeah. These are overshoes and they're exciting for two reasons. They're exciting because it means the inside is interesting enough that someone wants me to wear overshoes to prevent the outside coming in. Um, and the second reason is that I have been annoyed all my life by plastic disposable overshoes. Genuinely, people put them on and throw them away. And maybe sometimes that's necessary, but I reckon most of the time it isn't. Look at this. this these people have a whole box of reusable cloth overshoes. Proves it's possible. So there. And, and this I'm is the first campaign we've had them. We chose this year just for you. So, good. I wasn't going to come until you sorted those out. <laughs> I hope you know that.
So this bit looks familiar. I mean, like, it looks like it hasn't changed either. This well, is we have to seats. we have to to take off and land just like any other aircraft, of course. So we have uh, we have the seats. We have the normal safety features. Right. Um, in fact, this plane used to belong to the German cabinet. This was uh, <laughs> really? Angela Merkel's plane oh, until right. until a few years ago. Yeah, and, and, and now it's got it's now got, got, got a bunch of scientists. Indeed, well indeed. Science. <laughs> uh, right. So this we've got a little bit of netting here, and it sort of looks like a play area when you come into this, just because there's all these like you know, uh, partitioned off areas. And that, soft surfaces, and soft the kids surfaces. would love it. It's basically a soft play area. It that's is, what it you've is. Got. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay. We pretend to be grown up though. All, that's all science though, isn't it? We're yeah. all playing with toys. We're just yeah. doing it protect with our adult hat on. Okay, so with a slightly more adult hat on, let's start with the play area. <laughs> 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 Tell me about this bit. Right. Well, this is the free floating area, and this is the only place in the plane where we're allowed to free float. It's just occurred to me it should be called a free floating volume, shouldn't it? But yes. anyway, <laughs> this is the only place you're allowed to free float. <laughs> Um, the mathematicians will have a word <laughs> with you. Sorry. <laughs> On the rest of the plane, yeah. um, everyone has to use these red straps to, to stay down next to their experiments. Otherwise, they could f float around, land on top of each other, land on top of the hardware, hurt themselves or hurt each other. Right. So here, you don't have to. So if we find ourselves with any time when we're not hard at work, yeah. and maybe test subjects that have already finished their job, mm -hmm. or operators that aren't necessary for particular parabolas, depending yeah. on the operational procedure, then if they've got parabolas, are off. They can come here, maximum three people at once, otherwise right. it gets a bit crowded I mean, and dangerous. three looks like quite a large number in there. It's not that big, your volume. Um, it, it's quite uh, big once you realise that you're not just using the area, you're using the, the volume. volume. Yeah. And then you can float around in here quite, quite freely. The only thing to remember is um, towards the end of the parabola, try and put your feet towards the ground. Right. And this plane can also recreate lunar gravity and Martian gravity, other gravities, right? Absolutely, yeah. The, the piloting technique that they use, they have a G-meter that they can follow, right. particularly the pilot on the pitch has to be careful of this because he's controlling this right. axis. Yes. Um, so he can choose whichever target he wants. And yeah. on this campaign, we're doing only zero G. But indeed, they can do lunar gravity, um, 0.16, Martian gravity, 0.38, or anything else. Um, so we have some partial gravity campaigns when we have experiments that want to fill in the gaps. They know zero G right. results, they have one G results. They want to find out where a threshold where their um, regime switch from one to another. Yeah. They want to fill in the graph or the data points in between. Right. So we have a campaign plan next year that has one quarter G, one half and three quarters, oh, for right. example. This is actually the largest um, experiment area of its type. There right. are a couple of other planes like this in the world, but yeah. this is the largest uh, volume. You can have uh, all, all sorts of experiments. I mean, yeah. there's quite a lot of fundamental physics, particularly in, in, in heat transfer and phase changes. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we have some technology experiments that are testing um, apparatus that's going to be included in satellites or testing um, mechanisms that are going to go onto space stations or, or other, other destinations. Right. Um, but it's not, it's not just that kind of thing. We have, we have biology, we have uh, phys uh, uh, human physiology on board, right. seeing how the human body reacts to inform us for long-term space flight, um, or just to, to understand a little bit better how gravity is driving some of our processes. Uh, I find it interesting that it's almost impossible to explain, the phenomenology of it. Uh, I, can't, I can't tell a blind person what it's like to see the color red. Yeah. I can't tell you what it's like to be in weightlessness. Yeah. Tomorrow you will know, right. and you won't be able to explain it to anyone else either. <laughs> but I will enjoy watching you find out. Right, okay. I will see the Fair look enough. in your eye after the first parabola when you go, oh, now Here I know. How are you feeling about it? I, I'm mostly curious. With things like this, I tend to wait and see. That's my general reaction. I don't spend ages thinking about what's going to happen next. You, you, once you relax and, and can focus on it, you're much more aware, um, kind of more viscerally aware of what's happening inside your body. So you can feel the <laughs> blood pressure change. You, you can feel like in, in hypergravity, of course, if you're standing up and I tend yeah. to stand so, so that I can see, the blood tends to pull in your legs. The heart pumps much harder trying to get it all up into your head. Yeah. And then zero gravity comes in and your heart doesn't stop immediately pumping harder. Oh, okay. So suddenly all this blood rushes up much harder, much faster than it right. normally would. Yeah. So you get a massive uh, oxygen yeah. surge, which is part <laughs> of the euphoria that a lot of people experience, right. I, yes. I suppose. And are you worried about the motion sickness element? Because a lot of people find that they 
your brain doesn't have any cues of what's going on outside because yeah. we've been in the plane and it is completely padded walls yeah. everywhere there's no windows <laughs> or anything you've got no idea what's going on outside and then your body is experiencing these forces that it's not used to and very commonly people do feel ill is that something you're concerned about and it has been the single most common thing so we've been tweeting about <laughs> yes. this i've told all my friends that, you know the friends i've told the first reaction is you're going to be sick you're mm. going to be sick you're going to be sick it's been absolutely reliable so part of me, I'm stubborn, I'm just determined I'm not going to be sick. <laughs> that won't help. But yeah. um, So there's two things that will help me out. One is that uh, they give everyone effectively seasickness medication. Mm -hmm. I'm all in for that. I, I, I never take seasickness medication when I'm at sea uh, because of the second thing, which is that I don't get seasick. And so uh, I'm fortunate in that respect, but we'll see, you know, I, I, I'm not very worried about it now. I will be extremely embarrassed if I, if I am sick, very, very much so. Um, but I'm happy with the odds of me not being sick. I was just thinking my closest experience to this would be that moment at the top of a roller coaster where you just start going down and yeah, you kind you of feel, you your feel like you're being pulled yeah. slightly up. You, of course, you feel your stomach go like, yeah. like at the top of, yep. a, of a roller coaster Boy, yeah. or a humpback bridge. The difference is here that you get that initial whoop, and, and then, then it stays, it stays there. there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so how do people react to this? As part of your job is in dealing with the humans who have... Uh, decided against against their better judgment in some cases i'm sure to, yeah indeed what, how do people tend to react to it uh, as you say it's a very it's a very you can't ignore the human aspects of it i mean we're here to do the science but the reality is we have to get 40 individuals on here everyone reacts differently um i've seen uh, first parabolas that have people literally screaming um, sometimes with joy and sometimes with terror. Um, that usually <laughs> resolves itself after a parabola or two. Um, sometimes with joy and sometimes with terror. Um, that usually <laughs> resolves itself after a parabola or two. So I do know that to the, the distress of almost every producer I've ever worked with, uh, I'm not a screamy, shouty person. Okay. I will watch what happens and see. So, so I don't spend a lot of time anticipating. Mm. And I think that for this kind of thing, you, you do the training, you understand what's happening, you know what you're going to do, and, and then you see what happens. And mm. so quite a lot of this in my mind, it's, it's another thing that you plan for, you do logistics. And yes, there will be playtime and fun when I'm there, but the logistics for me comes first. It's more about the precision to you rather than it being a sort of thrill-seeking, you know, like people, wanting that that rush of skydiving or whatever was that ever part of what drew you to this yeah we get used to that yes yeah. we i always enjoy when i am not uh, in duty in the cockpit mm -hmm. to come and uh, let me fly and it's always uh, wonderful to, uh, to to feel that but you don't feel a kind but, of well, adrenaline rush but after or anything um, eight, 8000 parabola mm. well you get used to that yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, most newbies on their first parabola or two they, they tend to try and swim um, which is entertaining right. but it doesn't help right. which is one of the reasons it's entertaining yeah. i suppose right okay. um, it's so it's those cartoon characters when their little legs are going yeah, and they're just yeah it, 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 in it doesn't achieve anything apart from make the rest right. of us point and laugh <laughs> Um, it's a perfectly normal reaction, of, yeah. of course, because it, it feels a little bit like swimming, a little right. bit like scuba diving in that you've got three dimensions of freedom, yeah. a little bit like skydiving in that you yeah. have the sensation of falling, at least at yeah. the beginning. Um, but it's not really quite like any of them. I'm interested to see how it compares with other things I've done. I understand that it's different, mm. but over the course of my life, I've, um, I've done a lot of scuba diving. I've been a springboard and highboard diver. Um, I've spent a lot of time on ships, which obviously where gravity is an uncertain <laughs> friend and you're moving up uh, and moving up and down a lot. And I, I did say to one of my scientific colleagues yesterday that I, it feels like if I think about it as a, you know, a wave that's got a three minute period, that's the time from mm. trough to trough uh, and an amplitude of two kilometres. That's that's it's exactly the same thing. It's just a lot more happens in between. So I'm I'm curious. I'm wondering how much to think logically about what's happening because mm. I was thinking um, we just watched yesterday's the, the day before me we watched that plane take off and I was thinking that um, 
I put a lot of trust in technology in my life, right? That we all do. That's mm. part of being a human in, the, in a modern civilization. That, you know, we might go to the dentist, they might give us an anesthetic, for example, and we just let them do it. And we get in cars and we get in planes and, you know, we just take, we just accept all of these things mm. where we're actually trusting technology. And it occurred to me that of all the activities you can do where you just have to trust humans and technology apart from actually going into space <laughs> this is probably the most severe test of your okay. logic over emotion thing because if you think about this it is utterly stupid it sounds suicidal it's a terrible idea right mm. absolutely no question terrible how do you do, do you ever feel that that sort of primal like i know this is safe my logical part of my brain is telling me this is yeah. safe but I'm falling out of the sky. Do you ever feel that kind of concern, fear? No, but well, it's when you are a pilot, mm. of course, you always have this kind of feeling is that you rely on the techniques, mm -hmm. but with always some, some, somewhere in your mind that it can fail and we, you must be ready to, to react. So you, Every, you uh, simulate it, the it failing yeah, and well, out the, the, the sky main the, the main uh, new risk that can mm. happen uh, of this uh, th this specific uh, maneuver is that something will uh, jam the the pitch, and uh, when you are 50 degrees angle of pitch and you want to enter the parabola, then you couldn't push, and then they crash like, like that, and you have something to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do if that happens? And then where we do a maneuver that, that we are used to do in the, for uh, fighter fighter aircraft. So the the, um, the guy in charge of the uh, of the role will bang the aircraft so that you, you stop you stop uh, climbing and so you, you begin you begin to uh, sideways. And uh, there is even if the um, and uh, the elevator is jumped, then you can use the pitch trim. Mm -hmm. So then you, you have to have a very quick reaction to put the, the, the trim full forward, and then you, you will begin to recover the aircraft. And yet, with human logic and ingenuity, and engineering that works, and pilots, that's very important. This, this, you can make this happen. And uh, in the modern world, world, we try to make automatism for everything mm -hmm. on, on this type of aircraft. Mm -hmm. The pilot is only taking off, yeah. then engage the autopilot. Right. And then the pilot is only, if I could say, a system monitor. Yep. But you don't fly really the aircraft. Right. In, in for uh, the, this aircraft, this special mission, we really fly the, this aircraft. And, uh, very, you really enjoy very that, Very accurate, yes. Yeah. Very interesting, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering when I'm up there how much I'll be thinking about the amount of falling that's going on and how much you're just so wrapped up in the experience of not having contact forces with things mm. that actually you just forget that you're falling through the sky at 300 knots or whatever it is, you know, or whether, yeah. whether it's a necessary part of the experience. But mostly I'm just, um, I'm just cur I'm curious to watch how I react. Mm. That's always the most interesting thing, actually, is there's all these interesting things going on. But the thing that interests me is what am I going to learn about myself? Mm. I mean, you know, as well as uh, th that's always there in the background. What, what, is, what is this going to tell me about me? Um, so it's, it's going to feed that, feed that compulsion. Well, we're looking forward to seeing how you get on as well. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we Should all? Should be fun. <laughs>
are going to close in about five minutes. So I think this is time for Trent and me to go. leave. So we don't accidentally end up up there with you. We, <laughs> it would be quite funny. We haven't been through all the training, so better not. Good luck. We'll see you on the other side. Come on, Trent. It's time. They shut the doors. The plane is starting to taxi. We've heard that the weather conditions are best today over the Atlantic, so that's where they should be heading to do their parabolas. Uh, and we're really looking forward to seeing Helen when she gets back and find out how she found it. It is now 29 minutes past nine. We've just headed out over the Atlantic. I think that's where we're going. And everyone immediately went to their the first parabola is expected in uh, 10 minutes. So, it's actually 10 minutes before the first parabola, thank you. So you just heard the announcement, 10 minutes for the first parabola um, and everyone is straight in on their experiments getting ready and I'm going to hang about in the free float area to experience my first bit of zero G. I am lying on the floor because that is what you have to do apparently to prepare for what's about to happen. Hypergravity first, then the zero G. <laughs> I could get used to this. Ooh. 20. 30. Bravo. <laughs> this wasn't meant to be this much fun, right? <laughs> okay, that's probably enough now. <laughs> you can do up here is you can imagine yourself in so many places in the galaxy and the solar system high up in the sky where things are floating around like this and even a little bit of science in this environment whoops it's really useful free pirouette there you go um just because it's so different so this is what we take for granted on earth that the less dense fluid which is the olive oil here floats up to the top the more dense fluid which is water goes down to the bottom Oh, you're about to go. So in hypergravity here, that sorting process happens really quickly. There is a big incentive for the more dense water to get down to the bottom of the bottle and for the air to get up to the top. But imagine now that the olive oil is just air, for example, or the water that's carrying heat warmer than its surroundings so normally it would rise to the top and look what's happening here it just stays wherever it's put there's no reason for the oil the, actually the water is right on top of the oil here and so if fluids don't sort themselves out using density that's a real problem if you want to move heat around both conduction because if you sweat for example you've got no airflow past your arm there's no reason for warm air to move and if you want to move air by convection which is you know air currents warm air tending to rise you can't do that either so basically what that says is that either in any microgravity situation or even on another planet perhaps on the moon or on mars um i know the moon's not a planet um the problem you've got is that you cannot assume that heat will just move itself away the normal mechanisms that we take for granted of conduction and convection won't work so you have to rely on radiation and that is a problem both for satellites and for spacecraft. This is the last parabola of the flight and I've strapped myself into my normal airplane seat for a very specific reason. I've been in very happy ignorance of what this plane is actually doing until now. You wouldn't know in there what was going on. All you know is that gravity is changing. There's a window here. So I'm going to spend the last parabola looking out of the window just to appreciate quite how ridiculous this all is. This is the only thing I'm nervous about, how my brain is going to react to really seeing what we're doing. Generally, I like knowledge. I think it's a good thing. It helps you understand stuff. Yeah. 10 seconds. Feel the plane accelerate. Here we go. Five, three, two, one, four, left. And now I can feel the plane fly 
not falling. My God, this one's a difference, being able to see. I am really struggling not to swear. 20. I broke, I broke. 30. Ignorance really was bliss. Wow. It turned out. Good grief. Of the whole thing, that 22 seconds was the most amazing of the lot. Because I could feel where we were, I could feel what we were doing, and I was terrified. On next week's episode, we'll start to take a closer look at the cutting edge science being done on these flights. To start with, I'll be speaking to a team that are working on how we might one day be able to 3D print building materials out of the very surface of other worlds. Thank you for watching. Don't forget you can like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel for lots more and head to cosmicshambles.com for all sorts of different things that we do. And of course, we owe a huge amount of gratitude to ESA, to Novaspas, and especially to our Patreon supporters for letting us join in with this and helping us share it with you.